Welcome to St. John's Episcopal Church. This is our Good Friday liturgy, and I hope you were able to print out from the website program. But if not, we will be sharing with you the page numbers in the Book of Common Prayer and in the hymnal. I hope you also have had a chance to gather a cross from somewhere in your house so that you will be able to venerate that at the veneration of the cross. Our service begins on page 272 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be our God. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had been, not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him with a portion of the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercessions for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. 
my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, the trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many young bulls encircle me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They look to my Our second lesson this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. The Holy Spirit testifies, saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Judas, who 
who betrayed him also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought up a detachment of soldiers together with the police, from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with their lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Who are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fill, fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom he gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officers, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of these man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it, warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I had spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then they had sent him bound to him, sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warning himself, and they said to him, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man who, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it. And at that moment the clock, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid the ritual to Pilate and be able to eat at the Passover. So Pilate went on to them and said, What accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, You asked this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. You want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted and replied, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was abandoned. Then Pilate took Jesus, Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and a purple robe. Pilate said to him, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release him, this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbat. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull which in Hebrew was called El Gabi. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had anticipated an, an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do you not write the king of the Jews? But this man said, I am the king of the Jews, Pilate answered. What have I written? I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, and the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of where Jesus, the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. 
Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scriptures, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, since it was the day of preparation. The Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may also believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of the scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to take him away, the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of garb and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloth, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And also, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Intense hatred is so emotional that it's almost impossible to comprehend. It takes such a grip on a person that all rationality goes out the window. Hatred can be so self-consuming to the point that all understanding, compassion, and forgiveness becomes an impossibility. It can be so intense that a person is no longer seen as human. They become a nothing that needs to be gotten rid of. 
I'm sorry to say that this kind of hatred does exist today. Racial hatred, ethnic backgrounds, economic status, religious preference. Unfortunately, the list goes on and on to the point that it's impossible to count how many people have been affected by racial hatred. This kind of blind hatred defies explanation, except to say that this is sin doing its worst and ugliest. Today, we focus on the treatment of Jesus, climaxing in that last night of his earthly life, unrestrained hatred at its worst being unleashed on Jesus. Jesus, who had only been going about and doing good, he had done nothing to deserve the raw hatred that he experienced at the hands of his enemies. Pilate testified to the Jewish authorities, I find no guilt in this man. And yet he was beaten and whipped, spat on and punched, mocked, and finally crucified. For those of us who have seen the movie, The Passion of Christ, the scene of Jesus' crucifixion remains indelible on our lives. Jesus was so intensely hated that even his dying words were mocked. His innocence didn't matter. He was an inconvenience that had to be gotten rid of. We are horrified at the behavior of those people in the crucifixion scene. While seen in the movie version, we don't get the sense of our involvement as we watch what others are doing. And we can do that with the event of Good Friday, observe it as we would any other tragedy, be appalled by their behavior and shake our heads at the senselessness of it all and then go about our lives without giving it another thought. However, the Bible does not allow us to do that. The story of the crucifixion doesn't allow us to sit back and blame those people for Jesus' death. Isaiah uses the following words. All we like sheep have gone astray. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was despised and rejected. He was despised as one from whom men hide their face. What Isaiah is telling us is that all of us are implicated in the suffering and dying of Jesus. There is no talk of those people, the Jews, the Romans, the religious leaders, killing Jesus. The finger is pointed directly at each one of us. We, you and me, despised and rejected him. It is true that none of us was physically there on the streets of Jerusalem when they called, Crucify Him. Nor were we on the outskirts of the city on Calvary Hill amongst those who nailed Jesus to the cross and made fun of Him. We might even kid ourselves into thinking that we wouldn't have behaved as those people did back then. Well, maybe not. There were those who didn't join in the shout for Jesus' blood, but neither did they open their mouths to protest this unfair and unnecessarily harsh treatment. Jesus' supposed friends slipped into the background, and some deserted him completely. Jesus' close friends are included in Isaiah's words, we despised 
and rejected him. But all of this misses the point of our involvement. The simple fact is that if it were not for our sin, our rebellion, our rejection of God, our own waywardness, then the Son of God would never have come to that point. My brothers and sisters, it was our sin that brought Jesus to the point of dying on the cross. When he died, all of our sin was laid on him, all of our rebellion, our lack of faith, and our refusal to believe in God, all of the times when we have hurt one another in thought, word, and deed. Jesus died in our place. A few moments ago, before I started my message to you, Deacon Bill gave all of you who are present a nail. This was no special nail, just a plain, ordinary nail, just like the nail that was used on the first Good Friday. This nail is a symbol of our involvement in the death of Jesus. For those of you who are worshiping at home, I ask that you envision that nail. Put it in the palm of your hand and focus on it. This nail is a reminder that it was our sin that nailed Jesus to the cross. Last year, Deacon Bill and I worshipped at Trinity on Good Friday, at which time we were each given a nail. Those nails which I have affixed to the front of our refrigerator are there so they're a visible reminder to focus on what Jesus endured because of our sin. As we continue through the service today, focus on that nail and appreciate afresh what Jesus endured because of our sin. Let this nail become the reminder of what Jesus did for us and reminder to ask God for forgiveness and that his power in our lives will change us. The message is clear. We drove those nails into Jesus' hand and feet. Our sins were nailed to the cross with Jesus. He died to restore our friendship with God, made possible for us to be his renewed and forgiven people. He gave us the hope that sin and death will not be the end of us, but as his renewed people, we will live in his kingdom now and forever. Good Friday is not just a sad story of hatred, cruelty, and death, a display of humanity at its worst. It's a story about sin, ignoring God and his ways, and how seriously God views all sin. This is a story about how peace was made with God, which ur urges us to trust in Jesus, claim the forgiveness that he won for us, and let our restored friendship with God renew our commitment to God and his ways and change the ways that we live each and every day of our lives. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? The words of that song play about the part that we played in Jesus' suffering and death. As we listen to the passion story and the words of that song, were you there? Let us do so with a humble spirit. It's true 
that our sin was responsible for Jesus dying. And yes, it's true that in Isaiah's words, we are healed by the punishment he suffered. Let us pray. Dear God, we remember today the pain and suffering of the cross and all that Jesus was willing to endure so that we could be set free. He paid the price, such a great sacrifice, to offer us the gift of eternal life. Help us never to take for granted this huge gift of love on our behalf. Help us to be reminded of the cost of it all. Forgive us for being too busy or distracted by other things, for not fully recognizes what you've freely given, what you have done for us. Thank you, Lord, that by your wounds we are healed. Thank you that because of your huge sacrifice, we can live free. Thank you that sin and death have been conquered and that your power is everlasting. Thank you that we can say with great hope, it is finished. For we know what's still to come, and death has lost its sting. We praise you, for you are making all things new. Our service continues with hymn number 171, Go to Dark Gethsemane, hymn number 171. Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death. 
and become heirs with him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Justin, Archbishop, for Michael, Presiding Bishop, for William, our Bishop, for all people of this diocese, for all the churches in Troy, and for those about to be baptized. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose Spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers which we offer before you for all members of your Holy Church, that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth to those in authority among them, for our president, to the Congress and Supreme Court, for members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, Kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace, and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase, until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love, and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you, that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for those who have never heard the word of salvation, for those who have lost their faith, for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, to those who are enemies of the cross of Christ, the persecutors of his disciples, for those in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you, as you are revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard. Let the hearts of those who resist turn the hearts of those who resist it, and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray. Let there be that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection.
O God of unchangeable power and eternal life, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which have grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let us sing hymn number 747, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, hymn number 477.
God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left unheard. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and ourselves. We are to be sorry and we will never repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be like you in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We do not presume to come to this thy table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our unrighteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather the promise under thy table, that thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and in us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feel him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The Book of Common Prayer reminds us that if one is unable to actually consume the consecrated bread and wine due to extreme sickness or disability, the desire is enough for God to grant all the benefits of communion. When being present at a celebration of the Eucharist is impossible, this act of prayer and meditation can provide the means by which you can associate yourself with the Eucharist, Eucharistic action open yourself to God's grace and blessing. Let us pray. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are on this day, and remembering particularly St. John's Troy, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life. For the redemption won for us from your death, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. I believe that you are truly present. 
Continuing on page 382, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church, peace and concord, and to us sinners, everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. 